Good morning, everyone. You're listening to Trace Elements live on TraceElementsRadio.com, Revolution Radio, Studio 8. Good morning, everybody. And whoever else may be listening in, I'm really glad that you are. I'm going to be talking about some information today. Before I start, I want you to know don't feel bad about this. Knowing's half the battle. We've done a lot of things that we haven't known. And I, I put up this little thing today called it the Ender's Game. And it was a tweet sent by someone else, but I thought it was really apropos. Because maybe this is what the Mayans predicted. Not an asteroid, not a solar flare, but the end of what we are no longer cherishing life or other people, even the earth or the animals or the resources on it war, genocide, abuse senseless mass murder cruelty, animals was horrible, gluttony greed, waste, lust look around you for many many people, the end of the world is already here they've been going through this for a very long time I realize that we're getting a constant bombardment. Conspiracies, conspiracy theories, and they seem to have diluted many people's perception of reality. It's as if we've become addicts waiting for the next theory and to get our next fix, spouting all about the problems of the world without any or even trying to provide any positive solutions. Knowing the prison in which one occupies is one thing. Getting out is another. And it takes more than a big mouth, which I obviously have, to get a clear picture of certain events which are taking place right now. So I want to get to the point. Synchro mysticism. What is it? To make it simple, it's the art of decoding hidden messages in the media. So let us begin. This is the time of the holy wood. At first, the tree was spiritual, universal symbol used by almost all pre. Christian cultures and you know the big four religions which to me are the same a symbol for dreams hallucination magic tribes use the holy tree the holly tree to produce staffs wands they believed the holy tree could protect them from evil spirits in folklore, there is a deity known as the Holy King who ruled agriculture, nature, from summer to winter. This Holy King was depicted as a bearded old man dressed in winter clothing, wearing a wreath of holly around his head. He also carried a staff made of holy wood. Before that, it was a woman. We've talked about the tree. Ashtar, Ashtar. We are in the month. Yesterday, shortest day, that there was almost no sun yesterday. But here I'm in Ontario, Canada, and it's raining. It's raining. So this month of December is the month of Saturna. And while December is seen as our 12th month now, its name actually means 10, as in Deca, December. It's a pun towards the axe, or the X, or the X-Men, or the X-God, as in Xmas, Christmas. Xmas means the end of the Mass. The Mass, in tradition, 
means the ceremony of death, as in Catholic Mass. Yax also meant the end for anyone who found themselves on the chopping block. Characters such as Santa Claus, Saturn, Orion, Odin, Hearn, Cain, Quetzalcoatl, Ham, Osiris are all the same character, which we will talk about today. Of course, October is our tenth month, but oct actually means eight. November is our eleventh month, but means nine. September is the ninth month, but sep means seven. This number, conundrum, has a great deal to do with why we are getting fooled so often with timelines. December, 10th month, because 10 means the close of something. Like when you close a window, or close a door, or the window on your computer with an X. You press X to close a window. That's why. These things weren't random. Someone knew this stuff. Now the date of the close was the 21st. And you will find connections with this date. When you consider that they told us December was supposed to be 12, so the 21st is just a 12 backwards. Now the year that they told us ringing out in our minds was 2012. The object of such numbers is simple. 12 is seen as the number before completion or the number associated with something that is not done, not complete. 13 as the complete circle or cycle. This is determined and shown to the Mayans by the priestcraft in addition to how to observe this coincidence, these occurrences. And it has to do with the planet Venus, too. The so-called gods time their appearances to various tribes using the planet Venus, since it was also a navigational tool used by seafarers. Venus is the rose, or the compass rose, with eight points, which navigates use. But occultists also associate the star Venus with the star of the Elu. Venusian numerology is heavily embedded in the occult. Venus rings out with the numbers 5 and 8 and 13. Venus orbits the sun 13 times in 8 years. Venus traces out a pentagram which has five points in the night sky every procession of eight years. Eight plus five is thirteen. It takes 584 days for Venus to go around, catch up with the Earth again. 584 times five gives us 2920. 2920 divided by 5 is 365 days. So you will find this everywhere. These things related to 12 and the mysteries of 13. Of course you have 12 zodiac signs. With the now recent addition of the 13th sign. Acfucius. The serpent bear. You have 12 disciples and then Jesus making the total 13. In order to not make this confusing, you can simplify the two numbers to find the deeper meaning. Because this holiday we're coming up to, this holy day, while we are deep in this holy war, 
has meaning. 12. Simplified is 3, whole, 13. Simplified is 4, 1 plus 3. On the earth plane, the knowledge of the triangle and the pyramid and its numbers are used by the priestcraft, the priest kings, the holy king, the king of kings, who's, well, they, they tell us what's going on. You know, people have seemed to, forgot, to forget that Rome is still Rome. So whether he calls himself Pope or whatever, it's the same thing. It's not that they're worshipping pagan symbols. They built their church on the rock, which is Peter. Hello? Peter is not a rock, but he can get hard. I've heard. But know that all of their little entwining has, has shown us and told us that they are the same thing. Now a triangle, which makes up on the face of a pyramid has three sides. It doesn't actually, but we'll let that go. This is the third planet and the third dimension. You will also find the number three used heavily in the cult and more related to the three syllable mantras used to affect the third dimension. You can see three as in as the minor and four as the next level. Four is often a number related to the god of the physical plane. Pyramid with four sides, tetragrammaton, is a four letter word. The dimension is said to have four gates, four original rivers, four seasons. The number four is also synonymous with a door or Daleth in Hebrew. Since three is a triangle and four is a square, this gives you the universal system for the house. We are the house, our bodies, separately and together. Keep that in mind when we talk about Santa who's coming to town for kids. Now the time used for the prophecy, 1111, which equals four. The sum of three and four is seven. This is the number of mysticism. These are the things that we've seen before. This is why these numbers are used. So I want, I wanted to tell you this so you keep it in mind. So. I have pictures up too. I have a, a little image and you can look through the pictures and see how all of these things tie together. So, again, a deity known as the Holy King, the Holy King. This is the priest king that I've been telling you about who ruled agriculture, nature. The Holy King was depicted as a bearded old man. He carries a staff made from holy wood, Hollywood. In ancient Rome, which is the, still the same Rome that's now, this tree was associated with Saturn, and more appropriately, Kronos, Greek mythology. Kronos was known as Father Time, so Chrono, Kronos, chronology and also known as the Grim Reaper, the father of the gods who devoured his children, fearing they would overthrow and kill him. Saturn is also known as the god of fertility and agriculture. For this reason, the Romans celebrated the festival of Saturnia, a Roman holiday, a holy day, a holiday in which they celebrated by giving holy wreaths to people as gifts. And it's interesting to know 
concerning the religion of Saturn, the cult of Saturn, had a particular way of dressing, and many Hebrew traditions can be traced back to the Saturnian worship, worship of Saturn, the gates, the doors, the cube, the four. in which many of their priests wore black robes. The priests also wore earrings to show that their devotion was to a deity and to a planet, Saturn, so the Holy King. Saturn, Cronus, devouring his children, a lot of times holding a Hollywood staff, old man with a beard, father figure, and again, father time, holy staff, this time it becomes um, a Sith, like a Sith Lord, the Grim Reaper, father of time and death. When Gandalf came back, that was the Holy King, the rings of Saturn, the one ring to rule them all, that's why that same imagery, the black robes, the Masonic hats, the flat hats, so that the gavel can hammer in ideas, hammer or axe. We wear earrings now, us women, guys too, but that's why. And then you have the priest king with a hammer judging you. Listen to me, children, or I'll use my gavel. It's a Masonic tool, and hit you over your square head. If you don't comply, you shall be punished. How does death row sound? Grim Reaper is Saturn. So, as you can see, there's a lot of symbolism in the world, and more than meets the eye. So what does this have to do with Hollywood and the Hollywood movies? This is the Holy War. This is what they're presenting to you. Hollywood is the world of illusion. The magic of Hollywood, in a sense, is to make people believe in one level of reality. It's no coincidence that many people build their beliefs and lives around the movies perhaps, but it comes as no surprise that Hollywood movies are notoriously known for the amount of occult, um, the hidden meaning, and their symbolism in the film. So what's the proof? Let's take a look at Star Wars, for instance. Who made the story? What is it about? You have George Lucas, you have Obi-Wan, Kronos, Saturn, Father Time. In looking at the story of Star Wars, many of the main concepts seem to relate or correlate with the oral history of the Hopi, indigenous people, a story about the sky people, the star people. What's more interesting is that George Lucas was mentioned by Joseph Campbell, a man who said he just happened to study Hopi and stories of the Orion Wars. Then we have the Terra Papers, which explains the story in great deal. A story which the Hopi consider to be the hidden history of mankind. Dan Winter has a lecture series about this. Now the Orion Wars was about two brothers or sides. A great space war. There was a huge planetary spaceship which was used for war, which was mobile and can shoot at things. In addition, the Orion Galaxy is a galaxy that is far, far away. One faction is a rebellion, the other faction is the old empire. If you look at the Terra Papers, they have images of this death ship, the AR death ship. 
And actually, the original story dates back to 1947, the Orion Wars. Then you have the Death Star, Star Wars. Stories, of course, dating back to the 70s and 80s, but it's appropriate that it's here because we're coming up to Christmas that has a full moon. So the Gregorian calendar has lined up. It's done a, a really good job lining up this this year, and it hasn't. It hasn't. Now, the Saturnian religions root back to Babylon. Summer. Around 3000 BC, if we can believe anything they tell us. There were these stones. Once again, stones. I don't know if they were named people. Or Peter. <laughs> or Pope. Or Poe. Anyway. It spoke about sky people. Rocket. Fire people. The bringers of light. And they were apparently giants. In the Bible, referred to as the Nephilim. Many people like to quote the works of Sitchin, in which he mentions a reptilian race that he dubbed the Anunnaki. His words. That's not what actually it says, but this is his translation of them, and this is why people use that term for these beings. People who came from the sky, who brought knowledge and enlightened people so they could grow food and crops and agriculture. Saturn again, the god of agriculture and food. So sky people, we keep seeing it all over. Um, movies of Avatar, who did it really slick, showing them kind of as male and female looking the same, and they're blue, and Babylon, and fallen angels, and Nephilim. So we can say with great certainty that Lucas most likely plagiarized or was given the story to promote some kind of agenda. And we can use the knowledge of Saturn and sky people to start decoding this. Luke Skywalker. Luke was Lucas with an A, but you can interchange vowels. Lucas, Lucifer, it comes down to bringer of light. Skywalker, reference to the sky people. Luke Skywalker, the bringer, the bearer of light, who came from the sky. Luke means this. Tracy Aileen means this. Aileen, Alien, Ashtar. You see how you can play with names. All means bearer or bringer of light. So, Luke Skywalker acquires the light. Will he bring balance to the force? He is the light bearer, the bringer. And they have this weird cloud city, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back. Sky peoples. People have been seeing a sky cloud city. Now these lightsabers are chakras. They are. And the chakra system is an energy vortex field. Areas which influence the human. Physically, mentally, spiritually. They are energy centers, points of energy flow. The active energy junctions in the body. So let's just, let's go through some of the Jedi and how they relate to energy centers. And you can listen to this again if you go see the movie. So the Red, the Sith Lord, the Sith Blade, feelings of anger and hatred, power, physical strength, sexuality, and all sorts of devious kind of purposes. This is the root chakra energy. Greedy. Egocentric. Domineering. Sadistic. Sexual energy. Entirely genital. Judgment. And biased opinions. The Grand Master. 
warned him that the feelings of physical and sexual power would become so strong that he would be reluctant to let go. He said that many adepts remained at their centers, the centers, the lower ones, cultivating massive strength and sexuality for all sorts of deviant purposes. You know the fire people, you know that that's what they're about. And they always sound nice, they're very seductive. Till the screaming and the running starts. Now, when Se Hung opened those centers, he found it was true deep sexual cravings, realization that he could develop the power of an almost unbearable martial artist tempting him and straining him. This is from the wandering Taoist. Yoda. Green. The heart chakra. Unconditional love, clear sightedness, joy, happiness, honesty, respect, compassion, understanding, generosity, um, with loving oneself in a sincere, non egotistical way. The heart was compassion, skill, appreciation, beauty, artistic, opening, it developed artistic ability and surrounded the arts. The Grand Master emphasized that creativity arose from the center and that people like mist in the grove, an unusually talented musician, singer, artist, naturally had theirs, their hearts open. Again, wandering Taoist. Now we can go through Luke Skywalker Blue. This is the throat, commun communication, clear expression, learning to take responsibility for one's own needs. Can be truthfulness over deception. Mace window, who is one of my favorites. <laughs> Purple. So that's the crown chakra. This chakra is the pinnacle of light force. It opens one's consciousness to the universe, the absolute. Now, according to Star Wars, Mace Window served as one of the last members of the Jedi High Council before the Great Purge. Serving on the Council, Window was often regarded as second only to Grandmaster Yoda. Even though he was eight centuries younger than Yoda. Windows' wisdom and power were considered legendary by many, as were the weight of his words. So another interesting note about Hollywood is how it's known to be run by Jews. Jews control the world, we keep hearing. It's just a cop-out statement, though, lacking some validity. We can see here is that many Hebrew sects can be traced back to the religion of Saturn. The first thing we do or did when we stopped looking inside I guess is you look up. There was all these bright, shiny things. We're going to look up. That doesn't surprise me. It's why the earliest languages, the earliest things, the first things we wrote on stone, are all star constellations. The written language was star constellations, and in a twisted way, it still is. So we know that Saturnian worship can be traced again, Sumer, Babylon, which can be traced to esoteric information about people of the stars, the light bringers. So we can conclude with a high degree of certainty, I think, that whoever is behind Hollywood has ties to the Jews, the Hebrew, the Saturn, the Sumer, the sky people. So when you see YouTube videos about Hollywood is satanic, Hollywood equals evil, Hollywood equals evil, 
Many of these statements are just conjecture, all hype, no solid foundation to hold the ground. In a sense, they have pieces of it right. Their associations are somewhat close. Does Satan run Hollywood? To make some things clear, we have to get away from the idea of this image of this being. Our perception of the word Satan is highly convoluted, so let's do some decoding here, shall we? Sat and if we break down the word, we see sat, which is already associated with Saturn. So we can we know what we're dealing about with the Saturnian lineage. Satan is an anagram for Santa. Now we get who? Santa Claus. Claus, anagram for Lucas. Holy King, Saturn, Father Time, Stars. You, you get the point. And again, we have the same reference to Saturn and Lucas. To truly get clear of what's going on, one must study and learn real knowledge. The hidden path, the inner works. To be in the know, you have to understand esoteric knowledge. Teach man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So some decoding films. There's a couple of really good ones on YouTube. One called Synchro Mysticism. That's a really good one. Two on um, Vimeo. Probably on YouTube now. Serpent Worship Part 1. Serpent Worship Part 2. Dan Winter. The Homo Serian Bloodline and their religions. Really good. They Live, the movie, really good. And again, Code to the Matrix from Savan Bomar, which uh, we've gone over many times. I even recorded it because I didn't like that chunky little, you know, that movie thing he had. But it helps. So, Hollywood, spiritual, universal symbol. Everyone has it. But it means dreams. It also means hallucination and magic. We have the myth of the golden oak king, who is the light twin and rules midsummer, well, midwinter to midsummer, and then the dark side, the dark sun, the holy king, the holly king, that rules the dark half of the year, midsummer to midwinter. We have the King of Shadows and the Guardian of the Gate. The Holy King, who is the King of Winter. The legend of the Holy King and the Oak King. So in many traditions, there is a battle. Once again, and this is why I'm pulling it all together. This is the Orion War. This is law and order. It's not exactly a battle. But it's why we're told Satan and God fight, even though we've seen them working together in the Bible. So there's a battle between the Holly King and the Oak King. In many Celtic-based traditions, the oldest ones, there is an enduring legend of this battle. Oak King, Holly King. These two mighty rulers fight for supremacy as the wheel of the year turns each season. At winter solstice or Yule, the Oak King conquers the Holy King, then reigns until midsummer or Lila or Lithia. Once the summer solstice arrives, the Holy King returns to do battle once again with the old king, defeats him. In the legends of some belief systems, these dates 
but the dates of these events are shifted, changed. Battle takes place at the equinoxes, so that the oak king is the strongest during midsummer. Litha. The holly king is dominant during Yule. From folkloric and agricultural standpoint, this interpretation seems to make a lot of sense. Wiccan traditions, the Oak King and the Holly King, are seen as dual aspects of, yet again, the Horned God. Each of these twin aspects rules for half the year. Battles for the favor of the Goddess, which is the planet, then retires to nurse his wounds for the next six months until it's time for him to reign once more. Often these two entities are portrayed in familiar ways. The Holy King, Holly King, frequently wears a woodsy version of Santa Claus. He dresses in red, wears a sprig of holly in his hair, which is tangled is a tree, and is sometimes depicted as driving a team of eight stags, which is interesting. We'll go back to Santa in a minute. If, if you go to my Sunday post, which you can see on the left side of the page, you will see the eight-legged Santa. Well, he's riding an eight-legged beast. I'll, I'm jumping ahead. Let me leave that. So the Oak King is a fertility god and occasionally appears as the green man so he is also Cain he is the sun or other lords of the forest ultimately while these two beings do battle all year long they are two essential parts of the one a one despite being enemies without one the other would not exist so it is spiritual. It is the battle that we all face. Universal symbol. Dreams. Hallucinations. The Holy King. Pagan. Or Roman. Or just a mutated belief that we already had. A bearded old man dressed in winter clothing all around the world wearing a wreath of holly on his head, carrying a staff made of hollywood. Kronos, Father Time, all of these things. So, this is where it comes from. This is why there's rings. This is why there is a Santa. Now, specific dates. Winter solstice is 13 weeks from December 24th. 21st, 22nd, depending on where you are. This is Yule. When the sun makes its northward trek in the sky and the days begin to grow longer, pagans celebrate winter solstice by burning a Yule log. Since the sun had reversed itself and now is rising in the sky, pagans believe this was a sign that human sacrifices that were carried out on Halloween, Samuel, had been accepted by the gods. Unfortunately, this is a way all religions go. At first, it all sounds great. And then comes the running and screaming and the human sacrifice. So we continue to sing, Deck the Halls with Balls of Holly. Troll the ancient Yuletide carol. <laughs> See the blazing Yule before us. Fa la 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 la. Roman Catholic Church later changed the day of celebration to December 25th. More to do with shopping, calling it a Christmas symbolism. The birthday of the sun. December 22nd, 23rd, 24th, the sun rises three days. This is the three days of darkness. This is what everyone's freaking out about. 
NASA never said there would be three days of darkness or eight days of darkness or three milli microseconds of darkness. But this is why you keep hearing that. So the sun rises the same degree and is said to have died in the ancient knowledge. This is because the sun is at its lowest level in the northern hemisphere. December 25th, the sun rises one degree higher and is said to be reborn or resurrected. Hence, the Christian super, well, covering over the Jesus birthday thing. But remember, Rome is Rome and will always be Rome. They have not changed the religion. They just called it different. Now it gets confusing, I guess. It is that they place Jesus' death at Easter, which is the crossing of the sun from the ram, Aries, to the bull, Taurus, which again is Babylonian in knowledge. It is the spring equinox in the old times as the sun enters Aries, the ram, because this is the point. There is more daylight hours than darkness each day. And this darkness is conquered. Darkness has been conquered. And the resurrection fulfilled. I believe every culture has this myth said in one way or another. Symbolic and physical. It's complex. Because the fable we know as Christianity, the essence of the true tale is very understandable. Now, the rest of it. The Christmas tree, sacred tree of the winter god, Druids believed the spirit of their trees resided, well, spirits of their gods resided in the tree. Most ancient pagans knew the tree represented Nimrod, reincarnated into Tammuz. Pagans, and I'm not using this word in a bad way, it's just the old knowledge, also looked at the tree, again, phallic symbol, and so does Rome, <laughs> the star, on top of the tree. The Pentalpha, five-pointed star. The Pentalpha is a powerful symbol of Satan, second only to the hexagram. The star is the sacred symbol of Nimrod, also the sacred symbol of Christianity. Number three, candles represent the sun god's newly born fire. People all over the world love and use candles. If we had bees, we make candles. We've used it in rituals, we've used it in ceremonies. Certain colors, again, are also thought to represent specific powers, like the lightsaber. The extensive use of candles, when there is no lightsaber around, but it's usually a good indication that the service is ancient, no matter what the outward trappings may be doesn't matter what religion they think they're worshipping. You got a candle. This is old. It's a lightsaber. You're calling certain energies. Next, mistletoe. Sacred plant of the Druids. Symbolizing blessings of fertility. Thus, kissing under the mistletoe is the first step of the reproductive cycle. And know that this still works. Women become suddenly fertile. Witches use the white berries in, in potions too. I wouldn't recommend it. Wreaths are circular. So they also represent sexual organs, female. Wreaths are associated with fertility and the circle of life. Santa Claus. Santa, anagram for Satan. In New Age, the god Senet Kamara is also definitely an anagram for Satan. The mythical attributes and powers ascribed to Santa 
are eerily close to those possessed by Jesus and Satan. The reindeer, horned animals representing the horned god or the stag god of pagan religion, Santa's traditional number of reindeer and his team is eight. In satanic geometria, eight is the number of new beginnings, the cycle of reincarnation. Illuminati views the number eight as a symbol for their new world order. Next, eight. Elves, imply creatures who are satin, um, Satan, Santa's helpers. These are serpents, servants of Santa, Satan, the lower life forms that they are. The red and the green, traditional colors of the season, traditional pagan colors of winter. Green, Satan's favorite color. So it is appropriate that it should be one of the traditional colors for Christmas. Red, the human blood, Satan's highest form of sacrifice especially the children. This is the reason communism adopted red as its main color. December 25th is the Nativity of the Sun, the date of the birthday of Tammuz, the Sun, the reincarnation of the Sun God. Traditionally, December 21st is known as Yule. Roman Catholic moved the celebration of Yule to December 25th. December 25th is also known to the Romans as Saturn Alia in a time of deliberate raucous debauchery, drinking through repeated toasting, usually as wassail was the key to the debauchery of this celebration, fornication, symbolized by the mistletoe, because we don't throw each other on the ground, but that's what you're doing, even the kiss. So the entire event finished with a great feast, the Christmas dinner. So, even the name, Christmas, Christi, Christ, Mass, meaning, well, Mass. Since all the pagan masses are commemorating death, the name Christmas literally means the death of Christ. A deeper meaning lies in the mention of Christ, thus Antichrist in view here. Because the Christ, April. He's the summer god, summer tree, the oak tree. So the pagans celebrate Christmas as a celebration of the Antichrist. So, all jokes aside, as you can see, there's a lot more symbolism that meets the eye here. It's why they're playing with us over and over and over again, telling us the exact same story in different ways but not so different anymore. We keep seeing the exact same thing over and over again. I don't know how many times they think they can hide this battle, this holy war that we're fighting. It's interesting, you know, because prophecies keep coming up about cataclysms, especially for next year. And it's why I thought I should bring it up. And, you know, I'm not going to be beating people up for them letting their children sit on this stranger's lap. But when we stop and think about these rituals that we are allowing First of all, kids start acting up around Christmas. We think it's because it's the excitement. Could it be that the kids know we're lying to them? 
were telling them to sit on a stranger's lap. And this guy is the one who's going to give them gifts, not us. So we are putting what we're doing in something else's hands. That your parents aren't the ones that are taking care of you in this time. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. That a-hole better not be looking in my window. Smack the crap right out of him. Let me see him one time. Seriously. Let me see him one time. So, instead of saying, Darling, I love you. We're having we're having party. We're enjoying each other. No. We are putting this over to something else. We are giving someone else the credit. For having fun with our kids. We're as a matter of fact telling our children. To worship this thing. Worship it. Why would we do that? Are we so. Weak now. That we can't even give us. Give us credit for good things that we do. Surprisingly. Every ancient culture knew about what this time of year is. So, customs of the holiday season, St. Nicholas Day, New Year's Day, Christmas, often incorporate much older traditions that have been appropriated, adapted, since we won't get naked and screw each other. Unless it's wrong, I guess. I don't know. So customs that encourage little children to be good. So as to deserve a gift from the dark side. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Chase Elements. So, oh, um, we still are doing um, the drive on Revolution Radio. And you guys have been gel- generous. I realize that it's a big money time. It's a big suicide time. Of the year. It's a time when people really feel alone. And I would like to thank my listeners specifically because you are so generous to me. I don't have that many listeners now. I, I really don't. So know that I'm talking to you specifically. You're here for a reason. Now, the spirit of giving. This is good. Spirit of death is also what is being celebrated this time of year. Because Saturn is old now, he's the crone. He's the old one. He's the nasty one. He is not our constant sun that we had. If you listen to the electric universe theories of things. But I want to tell you, because I'm getting you ready for a Thursday show, which we'll be talking about the Brothers Grimm, and how they said they were going to bring darkness into the languages. They made one of the first dictionaries in German, which was used for the creation of the English that we speak now. It's why English can be so dark. Why things have strange meanings. But all the ancient cultures knew that this was the dark time of the year. You go outside, it's dark, you know. And that's why this time of year, there were many darkness, many dark creatures, many horrors of Christmas. So customs encouraging little children to be so good So you can deserve a Christmas present. Often come with a dark side, a punishment. You'll receive from a monster or an evil thing if you aren't good. Even our ideas of Christmas and the things we sing about Christmas is telling you this. Nefarious characters vary from place to place. Different names, different images, same kind of meaning. Krampus a tool to encourage a good behavior. Santa gives the carrot. Krampus brings the stick. There's always carrot and stick here. Krampus is an evil demon, an anti-Santa. 
his evil twin, if you would. Krampus Night celebrated, actually, December 5th, the eve of St. Nicholas Day in Austria and other parts of Europe. Public celebrations that night have many Krampus watching the streets, looking for people to beat up. Alcohol is involved. Injuries in recent years have led to some reforms, such as requiring all Krampuses to wear numbers so they can be identified later because of their overtly violent behavior. Krampus looks like the devil, an alpine beast, the horned god, depending on what materials are available. Modern times, people can spend as much as they like to become the best Krampus all around. The tradition spreading all over the world. Actually, many cities in America now have a Krampus night, including a Krampus fest in Los Angeles. There is a cat, a Christmas cat, an evil night cat, Icelandic Yule cat, or Christmas cat. He's not a nice cat. In fact, he might eat you. So a Krampus and his evil elves. So, this terrifying Christmas tradition, while good little boys and girls are preparing for St. Nick, the flyby, we have to talk a little bit about the not-so-jolly companion. For centuries, Austrian children had cowered in the fear of Krampus, a horned beast who plays bad cop to the good cop, Santa. Krampus's job is to punish. Krampus is the Christmas version of the Scared Straight program. Santa leaves coal for naughty children. Krampus is known to prefer corporal punishment. He beats naughty children with branches. That Hollywood. He throws them in the sack and drags them to his lair. And he likes to work at night. Krampus and many figures of Krampus showed some kind of hairy beast, furred beast, long red tongue, horns, a tail, one foot and one hoof. He's a thing of nightmares. He is the nightmare. He rides a night beast. It has eight legs. It is actually one of Loki's children who only travels in hell. So this thing walking the streets? Well, I guess we don't at least tell our children that. But Krampus Nights draws thousands of people. Gives people a chance to terrorize children. Sorry, little girl. Can't see that. Krampus festivals were actually banned by Chancellor um, Dolphus after the Austrian Civil War. And as recently as 2006, an Austrian child psychologist argued the violence and demonic imagery associated with Krampus celebrations are not suitable for children and should be banned. Tradition, though, continues and has made it everywhere. Totally against the cheer versions of Santa. Santa who basically came out in the United States for um, a, either Coke or Pepsi commercial I can't think of right now. But let's bring it back to Earth for a minute because we're going to need to talk about the Brothers Grimm later. Let's talk about the realm of the Ring Lords, the Celtic Church in particular. Church organizations like the Celtic movement very much know about these things. And there's something called the European Council of Princes. The council was established in 1946, after the war, when everything changed on this planet, and the object was fairly straightforward. It was at a time when there was tremendous fear about the build-up of extremists, right-wing factions at the time, 
There's also a fear that communist left wing would take hold in Europe. It was decided at that moment to set up a watchdog committee. International Council of Government, whose brief was to keep an eye on extreme politics and political factions. As it transpired, people knew that they had to keep an eye on it. And once the European common market came into being, it became very much involved with that in the 60s. The Council liked the idea of trading agreements and the general giving-taking thing, although it doesn't like things too much in the way they have developed into the European Union, but this was the precursor. So about uh, 15 years ago, it's hard to find, to be honest, but it changed itself to the European Council of Princes. And with the eventual establishment of European Parliament, there could hardly be a council of government as well. In fact, the council was not a government at all. It was simply an advisory body consisting of 33, interesting, European royal houses. Again, priest kings. These might be reigning houses, the reigning houses, the dispossessed houses, or the disposed houses. But whatever the case, the various princes and princesses of these families formed a council for the longest time now. Their objective has been a fairly simple one, and that is to look after constitutional clauses. She says to herself questioningly, within various national states, European countries, with the exception of Britain, have written constitutions. And so, when the European Parliament decides to enact this new law, or impose some new dictate, the Council of Princes is able to say, look, you can't actually do that, because it contravenes, say, Clause 7 in Subsection B, the Constitution of this or that country. The Council of Princes is not exactly political. It is more of a social council in practice. And part of, of course, American culture since at least 1992. And has been anyway since His Royal Highness Prince Michael of Albany, current heir to the Royal House of Stuart, the house that was deposed in Britain, 1688. Now the House of Stuart, having taken over the presidency of the Council of the House of Habsburg, Austria, related to its one-time Royal Academy which is very scientific establishment. And in fact, in the 1700s in particular, it was Rosicrucian, scientific, alchemical, at the same time. From the time of Robert the Bruce, the chancellor of that organization was given the title Prince Saint Germain. This title has very little to do with the 5th century saint, except indirectly but it had to do ultimately with the Stuart Royal Court in France at the Palace of Saint Germain. The Chancellor, the title, was changed in 1700s to Count Saint Germain and in 1890s it was changed once again to the Chevalier Saint Germain. Toss no French in there. So these titles, Chevalier Saint Germain, is where a knighthood came from, a district from an English knighthood, Franco Scott distinction, attached to the Stuart Royal Court of France, ratified by King Louis, sixteen ninety two. It is the key, the noble order 
the royal palace of Saint Germain Ali near Paris. I'm not real fan of the House of Hanover, as you may know, but it is attached to this. It is the oldest society in the world. It constituted the House of Hanover by charter of King George III in Britain in the middle 1700s. It's associated with what is called the Society of Antiquities, which in Scotland forms an adjunct to the historic Scotland, a government department. Well, as a non-fan of the House of Hanover, many joined and become fellows of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. So let's go where we are today. Duncan and the Nexus Team If you've ever read the book, The Genesis of the Grail Kings, which I highly recommend, and I'll, I forgot to put up a link. I'll put up a link later. There was something called the Nexus Conference. It originally began, I, I think back in 1979, not the story, but what was going on. The bloodline of the Holy Grail. Now remember, this story was made from other ancient stories. The King Arthur's Tale which brought in the Holy Grail was done because people in Europe were rioting. You were doing what we were doing here in the 60s. You were banding together as brothers. And that needed to be stopped with a, a tale that the bards were singing to you about a good king. Which never really happened. Kings are always slavers. Always. But with the bloodline of the Holy Grail covering some 6,000 years of messianic inheritance from the time of Adam through King David up to Jesus till now. This was made up. This was made up entirely. The bloodline of the Holy Grail covers a historical period. Time of Jesus, 2,000 years. And up. So the genesis of the Grail Kings was written in answer of a lot of questions, which I definitely have because I don't believe it. How do we get messianic section of Grail Deus, so Dragon Kings? It was alchemically conceived, purpose bred for a role of earthly leadership. If you look back, to the records of Sumer, which talked of the gods, now named Anunnaki, and their creation chamber. I know it sounds like I'm jumping around, but bear with me. We see how great Vulcans of an era produced highward fire stone, white powder, monatomic gold that was used to feed light bodies, Babylonian kings, Egyptian pharaohs. We were pulling it all in together. They found a substance. They ingested it. That is not written in any of the Sumerian tablets, though. But they found something with it. Effect on the human body as salt has. Ultimately, they followed the senior line of royal descent, or ascent, if you will. People who are studying this, that there is actually a genetic line by the mitochondrial DNA of the dragon queens, the Cain, the Cain, that I've told you about, down to the time of Moses. There is a place discovered in 1904, high on um, Bible Mounts Horeb. The firestone was made there. This was the place of the walking up and down the ladder, of course. So now we take a look at wider scheme of things, in terms of folklore, fable, 
which have told the same story and told the story of the Pendragons. In particular, long-standing disputes have prevailed between any kind of sacred babble, babble or bloodline and the church establishment. But if we look back, Pope by Pope by Pope, we see emperors and the elites of Rome, because we are in Rome. And these stories have their historical roots. I know right now portrayed in fairy tale and nursery rhyme and gothic romance. It'll form the basis of where we go next. The ring lords of the dragon. And beyond the portal of the twilight realm. Which this thing tries to take us. So looking at the world of enchantment. With a little myth little magic, a great deal of historical fact, as some of the characters' popular legends take their place on the stage of reality. And we shall open a door to when I think of the most intriguing, if not suppressed, secrets of our heritage. On the face of it, the Grail-related stories, Cinderella, Robin Hood, Sleeping Beauty, Count Dracula. Same story. I know it sounds weird, but we don't hear the real stories. I'll read them to you if you like. They're pretty friggin' creepy. But each hold their separate mysteries, enchantments, truths, hidden deep within the words. It's not generally understood that they all stem from a common historical base, which is rooted in the deep culture. And even though some of the themes have their origins in lore, the majority of tales as we know them were newly slanted from the Dark Ages onward, especially from medieval times when the church's persecution of heretics was in full swing, leading the Catholic Inquisitions. Because popes at the time had the power to say off with their heads, basically. So he was a priest, king just like in Rome. And the symbols, the Aerobus, or Boris, sorry, detailed in everything we've talked about was the symbol of wholeness, unity, yes. Identified with serpent, yes. In the form of a ring, yes. Clutching its old tail and going on and on and on and on with the cross, though, first. Positioned beneath the ring, the emblem became familiar. A device of the feminine, the Venus symbol. Alternatively, with a cross positioned above the ring, it became a masculine symbol. The masculine arm of sovereignty, regalia. And with the cross positioned within the ring, became the Holy Grail itself, known as the Dew Cup or the Rosy Crucis. In the Cathar language of Old Provence, a female elf was a alibi, or yibli, or alibi. Alibi was given name to the main Cathar center. This was in deference to the matrilineal heritage of the Grail dynasty, for the Cathars were the supporters of the original Alibi Jens, an elven bloodline. You know, if I could go back in time, I'd say, look, you know you kids are following the jinn, right? Jen, jinn. It's, okay, we'll go on. But it had descended through the dragon queens of lore. Lilith, Miriam, Bathsheba, Mary Magdalene. For that reason, when Simon de Montfort in the armies of the Pope, uh, Pope Innocent III, descended upon the region, 1209. It was called a B. Genis, Genesian, something like that, crusade. But if they knew exactly what they were saying, they're calling them the albino generation. It's deep. Tens of thousands of innocent people were slaughtered in this campaign. 
I, I think personally it's because we did a lot more genetically at the time than we're told and it would have given him a link that they found uncomfortable. So all of the inhabitants of this region were champions of what they called Grail Kingship against the pseudo-monarch that had been implemented by the paper machine, but it was the same one that was implemented by the Roman machine, but they, we forget fast. Practical terms, church kingship prevailed, at least from the 8th century, continued to this day. But the fact is, under strict terms of sovereign practice, all monarchies and their affiliated governments have always been illegitimate children. I think that's what's encoded in the world. In the words you're saying. So what is church kingship? Let's look at that. It's precisely what we have become so familiar with. It applies to all monarchs who achieve their positions as a result of a church coronation by a pope or in Britain by an archbishop Canterbury. In true terms of kingship, there is no necessity for a coronation because kingly and queenly inheritance and always were in the blood to be precise monochondrial DNA sangreal they are using this to say divine rights of kings which they don't have they're the same as us well intermarried so probably a little stupider but stupid does not mean safe they're crafty they're evil. They had to be. So by the Middle Ages, the church controlled all the European monarchies. With Scotland, a notable um, exception, as a result of Robert the Bruce and the whole Scottish nation were excommunicated at the time. They excommunicated an entire place. So the church, therefore, influenced every government, every parliament, every educational establishment as it does today and by implication if not direct instruction all military forces of any pseudo king operates only at the church command the church has enormous financial political and military power and it adheres to something they call the underground stream living in fear of their lives at every turn because you know, the Romans were bloodthirsty with everyone and themselves in particular. They were not only heretics, they were singled out for punishment as sorcerers, necromancers. And since it, it could not, well, nothing could really conform to papal citations, we are called Satanists now. Women, of course, all whores. That's not new. Roman Church had forged this dogma, this classification, at the time of their earliest constitution. And yes, the Roman Church has its own constitution. And before looking at some aspects of the ring legacy, it's important to consider the original document that made church kinship possible. In this context, I do not use the word important lightly because the implication this document some thousand years ago led to just about every social injustice that has been experienced on this world the document which I'm referring to is called the donation of Constantine all kings all governments all the practices for centuries have been based on the preset of this chapter. So they are in our midst under the rule of the grail entitlement. They think they are rightful kings and queens and have somehow forged an alliance to rule over us. They think it's legal. It's, it's weird how they do these things through law 
to claim ownership of you and your mind and your children. Look at Santa. Okay, he's flying over your house, that's your body. He's entering from the top, that's the top of your head. He's getting in, he's sliding down the chimney, that's your spinal cord, and coming out the fireplace, that's your loins. And we're telling our children, wait for Santa. These are the guys, I'm telling you now, wrote this stuff. They gained their position simply because it suited the church to crown them as its puppet representatives. Now moving forward in history, the pharaohs of Egypt, which is new. Pharaoh is not an Egyptian term, it's actually European. The Davidic kings of Judah, new term. The dragon kings of Scythia, not so new. We arrive at the Dark Ages. Why is it dark if we had all this good stuff going on? But we had the Celtic kingdoms of Europe, still fighting, centrally for the purposes of this story. I'm going to call them the Fisher Kings of Gaul, which later became France. It is because of this continuing period of what they forged and what they said the kings called it the Grail Sovereignty in the Celtic realms that conventional history now enters the Dark Ages and the horror stories. There is still an amount of surviving material from this age. This period is only dark because the church and the imperial overlords decided to veil it from scrutiny, moving documentary evidence from educational environment in order to perpetrate the myth that everyone and everything outside the Roman establishment is ignorant, barbaric. As detailed in the bloodline of the Holy Grail, the Church of Rome, founded by Emperor Constantine the Great, 4th century, has little to do with anything Nazarene style, anything of that kind of Christianity. It never did. It officially superseded and hitherto um, prosecuted anyone truly following that faith. The faith of the Christ was wiped out entirely. So people who think they're Christian now know that that's not possible. It's not possible. It was an entirely new, hybrid form of male-dominated churchiality based on a contrived, apocalyptic, apostolic succession of popes. The separate Nazarene movement that was actually called the Celtic Church, that's the Church of the Christ, continued in oppression under the direction of the Grail dynasties from the Church of Jesus and the family of Jesus. They were styled Despinati, meaning it means heirs of the Lord. But it was wiped out and not taught in any of the places where people think they teach Christianity. There's absolutely no way. There's no way. Not if you learned it in a church. Didn't happen. The bishops of the Roman Catholic Church undermined the true tradition. Eventually managed, in about the 8th century, to depose the Merovingian fisher kings of the Franks after 300 years of succession. With the sudden contrived demise of this dynasty, a new style of kingship was introduced in the West. Kingship, not by right of succession, but by decree from the Pope. And it was this which led to much of the fairy tale and the folklore which is so familiar today. A new style of papal kingship was made possible by the so-called donation of Constantine which, although now known to have been forged, was not open for debate at the time. 
you had to follow it. When the denomination first made its appearance in the 8th century, it was alleged to be written by Constantine. It was not, but it was widely taught, like most of the crap we get now. It was even dated and carried his signature, supposedly, allegedly. What the document proclaimed was that the Pope was Christ's elected representative on earth, had the power to create kings as his subordinates. The provisions were put into operation by the Vatican, 751, whereupon the long-standing Merovingians, the ancient peoples of all of Europe, were deposed, and a whole new dynasty was supplanted by way of a family who had been mayors of the royal palace, so prime ministers, basically. The royal families were wiped out across Europe. They were dubbed Carol Indians. Their only king of consequence was the legendary Charlemagne. The result of this strategy, the whole nature of monarchy, the whole nature of rulership, guardianship, changed in Europe then. The papal monarchs decided to procure a writer and a new language. We were speaking our own languages all around the world, but when the New Testament was written, it references all relate to the Latin Vulgate, the version of the Bible, the edition compiled, transcribed, translated by St. Germain, who was not born until 340, 26 years after Constantine, who died around 337 anyway who survived, he, he actually signed this document. So no, I'm just leading you up to how we got English, how we got the scary stories. These are the dragons, the true dragons, the emblem symbol, now the Holy Spirit, the ambrosia, the sacred blood, the graal, the Sangraal. Concept of fairies, the fair folk, was born directly from this base. Being a derivative of fae and related especially to fate, in the Celtic word, certain royal families, pendragons or head dragons, were said to carry the fairy blood. This is to say that fate and destiny ruled them while the elf maidens and the albine jinns were not of these people. So how is it dragons, fairies, elves of history became enshrouded in a supernatural enigma? Because they were real before. Real people. Not wisps of things, not things from a demon realm, not things from another dimension, but here. Why is it their stories were moved from the world into the realm and dominance of romance and nursery rhymes? How did this have to do with the donation of Constantine? To answer these questions, we must now step through the portal of enchantment to the twilight realm of the Shining Ones and the realm of the Ring Lords. Three rings for elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for the mortal men doomed to die. Says a lot right there, doesn't it? One for the dark lord on his dark throne, one in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them, the land of Mordor, where shadows lie. Tolkien, most popular tale of all time. Is it because we're remembering something in essence? The contestant ownership of the One Ring is little different than the enduring quest for the Grail, although presented in quite opposite standpoints. Both quests 
for the maintenance of sovereignty. Each has been misapplied various stages of history by those who are perceived as the ring holders and the grail, and they're using that as power weapons. It doesn't take any amount of time to change history completely. It takes nothing, no time. It's imperative, I think, to access these stories, to find out the one ring from the evil Sargon, Mordor, who essentially lost his power when the ring was destroyed in the fires of Doom. Tolkien's One Ring, which is portrayed as dark and diversive, and the Golden Ring of Grail Romance are the same ring. One is portrayed as love and enlightenment, the other, darkness. It's the same story. It is the story of the round table. A ring is broken, leading the land into chaos. When Arthur forsook the Celtic code in favor of the Roman persuasion, or later the Christianized version of the story, differently explained. When Guinevere is unfaithful, you see, she had to be unfaithful to Arthur with Lancelot. This is the Christianized version. This is the same story. It has been said on occasions that the great genius of the 19th century Richard Wagner has recognized the ring story as a version of the greater quest. However, if anything, the reverse is true. The Holy Grail legends were in fact stylized retellings of something ancient. Some would say it was an actual quest. I would say what we actually were. And this again goes back to we lost our wings briefly ago in the Arthurian writings that understood the Grail quest as being a spiritual ring quest. These are the same quest. This is the same story. It was not enough for people were thinking for themselves. Now, going back to Charlemagne, which we have talked to you about and showed you about before, where they had images of a cross and a crescent moon on the same church. This is not the Charlemagne that's even in evidence now. Hitler was confident his empire would be as strong as that of Charlemagne. He was so fanatically obsessed with finding the hollows of some grail castle. As a prime example of this misconceived notion of power, he thought this would give him true dominance of the world. Just like the Pope said that the king of the world will be returning, I would like to say that's brought to you by the letters B and S and the number 33. But in his search for the hollows, he obtained a lance said to be used by Charlemagne, insisted it was the Longina sphere that pierced the side of Jesus at the crucifixion. He said this was the sphere of destiny, the same one talked about in Grail lore, neither of which are true. But he was confident if he found it, his empire would be as strong as that of Charlemagne. It couldn't have been, because Charlemagne was of course doomed to defeat. The story goes he lost a magical weapon. And so it was on the 30th of April, 1945, the very day, Army, American Army, 7th, under patent, seized the lance from Nuremberg Castle. Adolf Hitler accepted this as defeat and allegedly shot himself. Fantasy, the concept of the Ring and the Grail, inspired hope, I guess, for social and natural events, made people more passive. The grail, hollows, sword, chalice, aerobus, sphere, guarded as tools of a princely art, 
which we've never needed. Through the best part of that millennium, no organization has misused our stories because we know some of it is right. I can't even say which part of it, but I know some of it right. But I know there is no good king. The Christian church has used it for its establishment. Like all churches are about power and control. That's it. Law and order. That's all they are. From the earliest times, the Rosy Cross, Rosicrucians, the chalice and wine of the Grail Sacrament was about the Albigens. It was a symbol of royal blood in the womb of the Dragon Queen. We jump ahead to William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Queen of Fairies, Titiana was a name who represented a pre-Olympic god race, the Titans. In particular, she was a moon goddess, Diana. Their king, Abaran, however, had a historical base, inspired by an ancestor of Shakespeare, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. Which is funny, since Shakespeare was supposed to be a poor man. But he was a founder of Elizabeth Tudor's 16th century court poetry and magic syndicate. Along with Bacon and John Dee and Edmund Spencer, the other Rosicrucians called under this dream, who aided and guided, if not wrote, all of Shakespeare's work. You know, I, I'm leaning towards it was John Dee, or it was Francis Bacon. But that's okay. Edward de Vere at the time. We'll finish this on on Thursday, guys, because we have to bring in the grim 